everybody. Welcome to this first video on classical Greece. Uh, this is going to be the geography, the wider global context, the society, religion, and then Athens and Sparta. And so the goal of this overview, again, this is really just identification and description level stuff. But what you want to pay close attention to are those terms that are in yellow. Uh, particularly, like, take note of when I, I, I take the time aside to describe what a word means or to explain an idea or make a connection or particularly, like, draw attention to an image. Those are important times to take notes on those things. So let's take a look at the world. So this is the world that the Greeks likely had access to and, you know, later Greeks would have some awareness of this wider scope. Uh, here's what we understand to have been true about the world at about 500 BCE. You can see that there are the Greek states right here, and all the things in blue are places where they're sort of like organized states, but that are not yet empires. So you got the Greek states there, you got italics, will become Romans later, you got Greeks will spread around on the coastline, you've got the huge Persian Empire, like we had talked about before, and then you've got a variety of other less settled cultures all around them. Uh, you also have the Carthaginians, who you will recall are the Phoenicians, uh, who have spread out all in this area that are this part of the brown. Uh, and then not yet, the Mauryan Empire is not there yet, but there is the Zhou dynasty, although it's currently falling apart, you will recall, in 500 BCE. So here are the Zhou states, because now they're all broken up into individual states. And so the Greeks, if you were a Greek, you'd be like aware of all of this Mediterranean area and up into the Black Sea there, but you'd be really aware of the fact that there's this huge looming Persian empire. So let's talk about the major geographical uh, regions and things like that. Here are some key bodies of water to begin with. The land, the water is dark blue in this lovely hand-drawn map, and the names of water things are in a dark blue. So you've got the Ionian Sea over here. You've got the Aegean Sea, uh, the Dardanelles, which is a really narrow area of water that leads up here, and then eventually through another narrow area up into the Black Sea. So the Dardanelles, they're important because there were large uh, shipments of grain that consistently came down through them, and so the control of this area was really, really, really important for Athens and later, um, you know, control like for Persia, anyone who wanted to fight over that area and get grain, which everyone wanted. So the Black Sea is up there, extends way further up than this that you can see in this picture. Uh, and the Mediterranean Sea is all of this more southerly area that's a huge, huge space. Sometimes we'll hear these things called basins. Basically, all of the land that touches this area that is this sea is like a basin. Basin means like bowl. So you can think of this area as like a big bowl holding this water. So the Aegean Basin, Mediterranean Basin, uh, if you see that, you'll be able to recognize that. And then there are some important peninsulas. So Asia Minor is a peninsula. It's got water on three sides. The Black Sea, the Aegean Sea, and the Mediterranean Sea. The Balkan Peninsula, it's got it on three sides. Aegean Sea, Mediterranean Sea, Ionian Sea. The P Peloponnesian Peninsula, it's got water on three sides. Same ones. So, uh, these peninsulas are important because you can see here that they are the locations of some of our major settlements. So, you see Athens over here on the very tip of the Balkan Peninsula. You've got Sparta down here on the Peloponnesian Peninsula in you know, ancient Greek history, that was Troy up there, uh, just on the tip of Asia Minor. So there are lots of Greeks living along here as well. And uh, you also got Crete down here, its own little island. Uh, and then Macedonia up here on the Balkan Peninsula. Pretty important. It'll become really important in Greek history later. So why, though? Like, why did Greeks develop the way that they did in these places? And I think their geography had a lot to say about that. So you can see we're in the very southern tip of the continent, so it's relatively warm, also pretty arid place, like there's not a huge amount of rainfall. They do have water on all three sides, though, and because they had lots of mountains in the middle, which prevented them from easily traveling over land or doing large-scale farming, but they also had these bays and harbors. Uh, a bay is a protected area of water where it's easy to put ships safe from storms out at sea. And harbors are uh, these you know, natural areas with sort of deep bottoms to them where you can easily have ships coming and going consistently and get safely up to the coastline without you know, hitting rocks and stuff like that. So 
you can't get across the mountains. It's really hard to farm because there's not a lot of big open space. But you have these really great things if you wanted to, say, go across and trade at the island across the way. So this geography gave a lot of advantages to sea trade, but also to city-states. Because as a city, you could control all the farmland between you and the next line of mountains. And the people across the mountains would have a hard time coming and doing stuff to you because there's mountains between you. And as a result, what developed in Greece was a lot of city-states, similar to what we saw with the Phoenicians. So polis is the Greek term for an independent city-state. And they're often either you know, the city-states in Greece or they were Greek colonies as they spread out across the different basins, the Aegean Basin, the Mediterranean Basin. And these city-states saw themselves as independent political units. And if you wanted to participate, you had to be a citizen. And we even take a lot of these ideas for how we think about citizenship today. So the polis promoted civic and commercial life because participating in the daily life of that city meant growth and, uh, you know, meant vibrant markets and things like that. And so if you were a free adult male, you could be a citizen. You have political rights and responsibilities. You could participate. Uh, women and foreigners had no political rights. And also, if you were enslaved, you had no pl uh, political rights. And early on, even if you, didn't, if you didn't have a lot of money, you wouldn't have political rights. So similar patterns to how the United States developed, honestly. So let's take a deeper look. Uh, because women and men all had, you know, and enslaved people had very clear roles in this society, it was very divided between them, it's important to know how folks ended up in these different levels. So people became enslaved by being captured as prisoners of war or born to enslaved parents or not repaying loans and debts like we have seen before. And they would work, uh, say, on farms or in households or in mines if they're particularly unlucky. And it was very, very widespread, as you can see here. And they also had a social structure even within citizens that divided people by usually both the amount of money they had and what responsibilities they had. Like if you're um, a hoplite, uh, person at this upper class level, you had to supply your own weapons and armor and participate in the military, for example. Now, let's take a look at a an example of a Greek city-state. So Sparta, it's not like every city-state was like Sparta. There's a lot of diversity amongst all these states. Um, but if you were to ask like, oh, what's Greece like? Then uh, folks from foreign lands would probably end up describing Sparta. Uh, so they were an oligarchy, which means they were ruled by a small group of people. They had a really rigid social structure. They were super, super militaristic, and their military was incredibly important. And every Spartan male was required to participate in the military. And the reason for this was because the people who were citizens, if you look down here in this pie chart, were a really tiny percentage, maybe like 10% of their population in 480 BC. And all of this gray, those are enslaved people. So 10% of the population had to control... 80% of the population, which is wild. So they were incredibly uh, militaristic and aggressive in order to exact that control. But that's how their society functioned, which is sort of terrifying. If you see over here, here's Athens, we're going to talk about in a second. They had way fewer enslaved people compared to citizens, compared to free non-citizens. And so their society was deeply, deeply different as a result. And... You can see in Athens, they actually went through a set of stages. So we've looked at how Sparta was, and Sparta did not change all that much over time, but Athens changed a lot. And it's one of the reasons that they have left a lot of legacies to future eras. And they started out with kings in a monarchy, meaning having a king that rules over you. But then they moved over time to an aristocracy, which is basically rule by the wealthy and powerful. Just if you are wealthy and powerful, you kind of get a democracy-ish for you. Uh, and then they moved to a system of tyranny. So tyranny, these were specific people, tyrants, uh, who took power away from the aristocracy and in some ways gave more power to all the other people as a way of maintaining power for themselves because they were basically dictators. So they changed a lot of the laws. In Draco's case, they, uh, he set down specific very harsh laws, but at least they were very written down and consistent. Think similar to Hammurabi's code. And you can see Draco over here. And then Solon expanded political participation, outlawed the slavery of Athenian citizens, which, like, I mean, a step. And then uh, those two tyrants eventually lost power to the democracy that was there, which was still uh, sort of tilted towards the rich, but uh, certainly better. And then it it is the idea of this book, The Lords of the Sea, which I really love by John Hale, uh, that 
the move to direct democracy and wide participation was pushed by this guy, as you'll see in a second, Themistocles. Look at the very bottom of the page there. So Themistocles had this idea in the run-up to the Persian Wars, which we'll talk about later, about creating a navy for Athens and that that was uh, Athens' way forward in the world. But by creating the navy which was so different than the way hoplite warfare worked, for example, where you're, you and your brothers, you all have shields and you're like defending the city and only the wealthy could participate. Everybody could be a rower in a ship. And in fact, everybody needed to be a rower in a ship. And so if you were going to be used for the war effort, then you likely got more rights or could demand them as a result. And so direct democracy, which means that everyone is voting on every choice or at least the big important choices of the day, not just a, a representative doing it for you and public debate and all these citizens having these duties and a sense of togetherness and purpose made Athens a really wild, weird, fascinating place as the origin point of a lot of what we think of as democracy. So we'll talk more about that later. And just as an aside here at the end, a reminder about the religion. They were in fact a polytheistic society that believed in multiple gods and goddesses, but it's important to recognize how integral it was. That means how essential, how important uh, how core it was to their culture, their politics, and their art. So you'll see that a lot in all of those places. And in terms of what role it played in people's lives, it helped them explain like otherwise unexplainable stuff, like the you know eclipses or uh, you know lightning. And so it also helped them explain like why humans are the way they are. And as a result, we have all of those ideas coming down through symbols and metaphors and idealized images into current society. So if you want to understand stuff that was written in like the 18 and 1900s uh knowing greek mythology has actually really helped even before that it's super super helpful and it's a useful set of ideas i don't know it's cool i like it you like it i like it all right that's the end of the video bye